you know, some of you may not know about compassion and how it started, but here's just something for you. This will encourage your spirit. A man called Evan Swanson, way back in 1952, as an evangelist decided that he should go out to Korea after the Korean War. So this is interesting on the back of what you're saying, Pastor Joel. And um, he saw that children there were in a terrible situation. They were being left at the sides of the roads. They couldn't, they had no food to eat. They had no hope. And he said to his church back home in the States, we need to do something about this. So I'm here to preach the gospel, but God has put something in my heart that I need to do something about this. And so they just set up a small orphanage, just looking after 15 kids. Evan Swanson is long gone. But 60 odd years later, over 1.5 million children have gone through compassion projects through the local church. And right as we're sitting here right now, there are 2 million children in 7,000 partner church projects in 25 different countries around the world. You see, when God gives you one small seed, he wants you to take a hold of it and to say, God, I will not despise the day of small things. I will not despise the day when you tell me something and say, what can I do with this? But I will say, God, I will take this and I will nurture the seed and I will pray and I will water it and I allow your Holy Spirit to do the work that it's got to do and I want to be obedient to you in the right now knowing that when I'm obedient to you in the right now, you will take care of the future. And so there are people that are changing lives around the world. There are, there's a senator in Haiti. There's a member of parliament in Uganda who actually heads up anti-corruption in Uganda when she was once a child just starving on the streets, just looking for sugar cane. But because she was sponsored by someone, someone who said, yes, I will step into your life right now and help you, she became a counsellor, then she became a local counsellor, then she, she was helping uh, as a politician in the local area, and then she became a politician in the national arena, and now she's in the cabinet of a government. You see, when you sow a seed, if you nurture that seed and you believe in faith that God can do something, God's not going to show you the whole picture. He's going to say, will you do this one thing right now and I will show you something amazing for the future. I'm going to tell you some other stories later on, but you're part of that story too. I thought it'd be good just to introduce you just for the moment, uh, just to my wife, Erica. Just stand up, Erica, will you? Just, uh... This is Erica, and she's from, uh, originally uh, from the Chicago area, and um, it's my privilege to meet her, uh, first of all, just a, a few years back, uh, when I moved to Ireland. And uh, we met, actually, at a at a conference where I was ministering about compassion. See? So, so don't, don't ever think, God's got it all worked out. God, God knows. If you're wondering, God, how are you ever going to work this out? God knows he's got a plan. You don't even know how it's going to work. So you just say yes to God for whatever he want, wants you to do today, and your tomorrow get work, gets worked out for itself. So um, we're meeting. We start to get on. I won't tell you all the whole story, but we start to get on. And eventually we start dating. This is like two or three years in, and we start dating. And then I ask her to marry me, and she says, yes, she will. And I'm thinking, right, okay, I need to get her an engagement ring. So I'm thinking, who, who of her friends can I speak to who will know? So I, I'm looking at her friends in the church that she was a part of and the leadership team. And there was a, a young lady called uh, Aoife. And I thought, I'll be sneaky, and I'll call Aoife. I said, Aoife, it's Darren. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, and she said, have you called me about an engagement ring? I said, well, yeah. How did you know that? She said, well, Erica thought, she's been having to think about it, and she thought, if Darren's ever going to contact any of my friends, which one of my friends is he going to contact? <laughs> and so I contacted Aoife, and said, gosh, it's terrible, isn't it, when the lady's always one step ahead all the time, and you're just going, what's going on here? And then so she said, I said, yes, yeah, so I'll contact you about the ring. She said, yeah. So I've got some pictures for you of the rings that Erica likes. I'll forward to them to you now. She said, it just so happens, she said, I'm the same ring size, so I can go shopping with you to get the ring. <laughs> Guys, ladies, got it all worked out. <laughs> got it all worked out. And so I can tell you lots of stories about that. And I want to promise you that my stories are not exaggerated. They're, no, they are. No. Erica, say, I've got a different way of telling you that story first. I just want to read some scripture to you. 
that I'm going to speak from a little bit later on, from Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. And it says this. You can see it on the screen if you, if you want to. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all of those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but what you have made is a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what the, these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, I have, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have heard perfected praise. Then he left them and he went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. There's a scripture in uh, Acts 7 verse 49, and Stephen is, uh, he's giving testimony to his life, and he's, and, he, and he's talking, and he's quoting from Isaiah, and he says this in Isaiah 7 verse 49, he says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house can you build for me? Says the Lord. And it's sort of a rhetorical question, because it's like, what can you do for me? I'm the Lord. I, I can do anything that I want, but what can, what can you do? There's not, nothing that you can match or you can do for me. But yet what we know is that God is not a God who wants to do things on his own. He wants his people involved. He wants you and I involved. He says, if you get involved in the process of building the kingdom with me, it's just going to bless you like you've never known before. You, you're just going to be like, wow, I am so pleased I ever got involved in this. I can say to you now that I've, I've worked with Compassion for being part of this ministry for 10 years. And when I've been at different events, I've never yet met anyone who said to me, hey, I sponsored a kid uh, with you guys last year, and I really wish I didn't do it. <laughs> I've had plenty of people come back to me the year after at a conference and say, I was going to do this last year, and I spent this whole year wishing I had done it. So I'm going to do it now. And when you get to build in the kingdom of God, God just, he wants to take you and make you part of the process so that you see what that can be like. But this question is, what kind of house will you build for me? And I think it's an interesting question because we know that God doesn't choose to build his house on his own, but he builds it with us together, working with us. And so we can think about a house and we could look at maybe a wonderful cathedral like Notre Dame that we saw in the news a few weeks ago that got burnt down. Or we can look at a converted warehouse like this. But really, God's not talking about the building. It's not about the building when, when that question is being asked, what kind of house? Because when people think of the church, they don't think about the building. They think about you and they think about me. They think, when I think of the church, I think about people that are connected to the church. I think about Christian faith and the walk by the people that I know and their witness to me. They may not say it that way to you, but that's the way that we look at it. So what kind of house are we building? And Jesus asks us that, what, what type of house is it? Is it one that's inward looking? Praise God, this house is not like that and has not been like that. A number of years ago, he sponsored quite a few children in India. I think it was around about 23, 24 kids in India. And it was so sad then what happened for us um, because uh, the Indian government, we've been working for a number of years, had decided they were going to clamp down on Christian organizations. And Compassion was one of the biggest organizations, and they wanted us to set an example of closing those down. They, they shut down over 5,000 organizations. This makes what Pastor Joel says you know, even more credible about the difficulty of coming in. They want to check on everything that you're doing now. But here's the thing. Even way back in 2006, before I was working for Compassion, I was chatting to some people in the Indian government and, uh, who were part of the Indian government. They said to me that it was registered that 2.5% of the Indian population were born-again Christians. 2.5%. That's 2.5% of 1.2 billion. Okay? And then he said to me, come here. He said, that's the official figure. The unofficial figure is 12.5%. And I want to tell you, there's such a move of God going on in India. It's amazing. And when something like this happens with compassion, we can say, God, what's going on? We, we, we want to be part of building your kingdom. But, and we, we were talking, we had U.S. senators speaking with heads of government in contact in India. It was more difficult for the British to be speaking because of the, of the historical context between India 
and, and India. And so we were trying to be very careful about how we were talking about that. And the Indian government was saying, oh, no, there's been a bit of a mix-up. But, but there wasn't a mix-up. They wanted us to leave. And we've had to have full integrity with that and leave. But we can look sometimes and think, what, God, what are you doing? Surely your kingdom's not being built in this way. Hey, look, you read the scripture just like I do. And at the time, of, uh, at the time of when the disciples were around, they were persecuted. And it, the Bible tells us they were spread all over the place. Now, anyone at the time would have looked at it and said, the persecution means, oh my gosh, the church is being crushed. But it wasn't being crushed. You know, what the devil meant for evil, God turned around for good. And I want to say to you that even though right now, in this moment, it looks like, hey, that's the end of compassion's influence or ministry in India. No, we don't know that. We are still talking with people. We're still talking and having conversations at an above-the-level line. We're not doing anything sneaky that we shouldn't be doing because we need to have integrity with the Indian government. And we know that in time, God is going to do something wonderful and miraculous. But we just need to be patient and believe that God says, I've got it all in hand. What the devil meant for harm, I mean for good. And we know there are local churches now that had compassion projects that are just growing and doing the whole work themselves. And surely this is what we're a part of, is empowering the local church. So what kind of house are we building? Well, Jesus shows us in this scripture in, that we just read, he shows us what kind of house we should build. But I just thought before we just talk about that for a moment, I want to show you just what you've done. I can't show you the figures for India, but I can show you the figures for Burkina Faso that you've, that you've just done in the last year. And you can do the multipliers in your own mind of what that would have worked out with India. So let's just have a quick look. Can we have a look at the slides there? Um, this is just in the last year or so. 14 children's lives have been changed, which we praise God for. Now, do a multiplier because when you sponsor one child, okay, you're sponsoring a family of four or five, really. So you, you multi do the multiplier up. You're affecting a community. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. There's Burkina Faso. So it's just right next door to Togo, uh, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, uh, all those sort of areas there. On to the next one. In the last year, 41 letters have been sent, 27 by the sponsored children, 14 by you. That's really good, but I want you to en encourage you. Would you continue to write letters to the children that you are investing in? Because, you know, when you write words of encouragement to them, they keep them in, in a little tin under their bed, and they take them out. And, it, and at the most desperate of moments, they'll take them out and say, oh, no, I do have a hope, and I have a future, because my sponsors told me I am. And they told me that I'm praying, they're praying for me, and that there are great days ahead. And, and they'll, they'll cling on to those words of encouragement. So it's not just about the money and the investment, but it's about the words that we say too. And the next one, the next slide on. Six girls and eight boys so far. You can see some of their pictures, their, their photos down, down the bottom. You might be able to recognize your child there. And, and the next slide. So since the partnership started, now this is just with Burkina Faso, not, not India. So we can do multipliers with the India. So the children have spent over 8,000 hours in the project. Look at the amount of nutritional meals being provided, two th over 2,000. The medical checks, so important. And the Bible's given out because 75% of the kids that are coming into the projects, they're, they're not Christian. And so they're getting taught things from a Christian world viewpoint too, which is amazing. And onto the next slide, if you would. So just in the past 12 months, together you've given nearly £5,000 plus additional gifts. And I just want to say thank you for that in Jesus' name. Why don't you give yourselves a, a round of applause and give God some thanks too for his goodness. That is going a long way. Um, and then just uh, onto that final slide there. there. There's some of the children's faces. Now, don't be worried if they're not smiling. Sometimes it's not culturally, you know, what happens. And, and also, when they had their photograph taken, it, they might have been playing football or something. You know, and, and the teacher said, hey, you've got to have your photograph taken for, for the compassion thing. And they don't even know what compassion is. It's just the local church helping them. So we're going to go back to the scripture. And I'm going to talk to you then about what kind of house you build. Because we've seen what you have been building. But let's look at what kind of house we should build and how we can bring that out. The first thing I want to show you is this. That in that scripture, it says this. That Jesus went into the temple... And he turned over the, the, the table of the money changers. You see, the house of God, for the people at that time, had become a convenient place. And I just want to put it to you that the house of God should not just be a convenient place. It's not just a place where we, came, we come to do our religious duty. We do our thing and then we go away. 
and then it's all done. That's not what the house of God is for. The house of God is for more than that. And you see, if we think that the house of God is for that, then God's going to say, I'm going to shake your world up so you get the real idea of what it's really about. This is what he did in the scripture there. He turned around everything. He flipped over the tables of the money changers. Now, if you want a passionate life, if you want a life where God is coming into your life in the fullness of everything that he's got for you, what's going to happen first of all is he's going to turn your life over. He's going to upset it a little bit, so you're suddenly going, whoa, everything's not as comfortable as it once was. Everything's not as easy as it once was. Now I'm feeling a little uncomfortable in my spirit. And you know, you don't need to think necessarily, oh, that's the devil having a go at me. Maybe it's God saying to you, I'm going to turn your life around because I need to get your focus on walking with me. I need to get you to be hearing my voice about what my house should look like because you are a representative of the house. And so it's important for you to be listening to the spirit of God and walking in that way. So he will flip your life upside down. And then when he does flip your life upside down, this is what the house of God looks like because God doesn't leave us with no idea about what the house should look like. So Jesus comes to the house, the temple, as it was then, and he switches things up down and then he says, this is what I'm going to help you so that you can see what it looks like. He says, the first thing is, he said, it's going to be a place where the blind will come and they will see. And he's not just talking about the physically blind, but he's talking about the spiritually blind. Those without any hope, they don't know what direction they're going in life. And he says, I'm going to show you the way that you should go. Now, I want to have an example here. I need somebody to help me. And I'm just looking for just a willing participant here who might be able to help me with this. So you're looking at me. Just, just come on. Give him a round of applause. What is your name? Sid. Sid. Oh, yes. Yeah, we met earlier on. Sid, I looked at you and smiling at me. You didn't look away. Because sometimes you have that thing when someone's going to choose us, and we think, if I keep staring at them, they won't choose me. So I thought I'd do the opposite thing, because he kept staring at me. I am going to choose you. So, Sid, thank you so much for volunteering yourself to help yeah. this morning. Now, I want you to imagine that I am blind. And, and just so for the sake of purpose, this, the door there is, is, the fu is my future life. That's, that's the entrance to my future, OK? And I'm, but I'm blind. I don't know. I can't find my way. So I'm going to shut my eyes. Will you, Sid, you just spin me around, if you would? Spin your yeah, eyes. just spin me around. Create confusion for me. Sid, not too vigorously. <laughs> You're getting carried away with your role. <laughs> Sid, now take me, Sid, by the arm, because I don't know how to get to the door which will take me to my future. Will you take me to my future, please? Now look at me, I can walk confidently because Sid has got me by the arm and I can just walk with my eyes shut and I can still can talk to you and I'm heading in the direction I'm going in because Sid is walking along my side. He is with me and he is helping me. And this is what God has called us to do. He has called us, thank you so much Sid. Awesome. Yeah, give him a round of applause. But Sid, I'm not finished. <laughs> I didn't say you could sit down. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. I just said thank you for the first part. Oh, oh. Gee, who's preaching this sermon? So, so you, when, you're, when you're blind and you can't see, you need someone to come alongside you to show you the way. Yeah. And God is calling us to bring people. He, he's saying, I need you to come alongside other people to show them a way. Now, that may be people in Manchester that you're around every day in your life, people whose lives you're in that I'm not in. I, I live in Dublin, in Ireland. I, I'm not where you are. You are where you are. You might say, I need Pastor Joel to be where I am. I need Pastor Evie to be where I am. No, no, no. You are where you are. And God has purposed that you will be there because you're the one that's going to lead and take people in the direction they need to go. And God has set you apart for this moment and this time that you would do that. Just have the confidence to know that God has placed you where you should be. So, you know... You can be spiritually blind and you need someone to come alongside. Now that took Sid effort to get out of his seat and to come and help me. It took an effort for him to stare at me in the first place. Now, it's, and, and so he helped me. And you know, this is what compassion does. You know, I was with a, a, a young man years ago when I used to live in Manchester. There was a young man called Johnny, an Indian graduate uh, from Kolkata. He lived in the slums. He was the first out of 10,000 children in his slum to go to school. There was one toilet for every 1,000 people. Just imagine that. I'm not, I'm not talking about like we, toilets like we have. 
How many people have got more than one loo in their house? Yeah. Do you know, even in here today, we're in the top 15% richest people in the world. So you can think about Cristiano Ronaldo or some film star, but actually we are in the, in the richest people in the world. And so John, a, he lived in this sort of circumstance, and he could not see a hope for it and a future. What he could see was crime. What he could see was drug addiction. What he could see was, to get, make my way through this, I'm going to have to work outside of the law. And then someone from the local church came along, and they said to his mum and his dad, and they were Muslims, and they said, the local church could help you with educating and, and just give him a chance. Would you like him to come along? And suddenly he got hope and a future, and he got a sponsor from America. This guy now did his, ba his, ma his master's degree in business at Manchester University. He runs a, he runs a, a, a charity where he looks after mothers and babies in India. He speaks all over the world, declaring the goodness of God when he was once in the slum. But you see, somebody came along, and they saw for him. They saw for him, and they led him in the direction he could go to give him a hope and a future. The second thing I notice in the scripture here, where the house of God is a place where the lame will come, and they will be made to be able to walk, that they could walk again. And it's, again, it's not just talking about the physically ill, but it's talking about those of us that have had knocks in life. You know what I'm saying? You know, like when, the, the, you know, when that's saying when you've had the rug pulled from under you. It's like you know which way you should go. You can see it, but you can't get there. You can't get there because you're, you've been damaged. So you're lame in life. Maybe you've got a broken marriage. Maybe people have died in your family really young or through an illness that you just thought it doesn't seem fair. And life... It just seems to make you lame and you just can't move forward anymore in your life because of the lameness that's there. And you know where you can go, but it's too much effort. And it's too hard. And people say, well, maybe God does love me. Maybe he is for me, but i I just given up on life. And they need you to come alongside them and say, there's hope and there's a future. Let me show you the way. And so what it takes then oh. is me... Relying on Sid, you ready? Yeah. And then, oh well, I haven't finished it. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then, and then I, I bear my weight on his shoulder because I'm lame. Is that heavy? No. no. <laughs> Let's go. We're going to the door. Is it getting? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is it getting warmer, Sid? Give him a round of applause. Come on, thanks, Sid. That's it. Good on. Good on. You see, that's going to take him time and effort, and it's going to put some weight on him. And God is saying to us, what kind of house are you going to build for me? When you build a house for me, it means the cost for you is that when you take somebody on that journey, you're going to have to bear the weight. You're going to have to take the time. It's going to take time away from other things that you are going to do. But will you do it? Because you are my hands and my feet. You are Jesus to these people. The third thing I noticed in this scripture was it says, my house is a place where wonderful miracles are taking place. It said there were wonderful miracles going on. So in the house of God is a place where wonderful miracles should be happening. Wonderful miracles happen in all sorts of ways. But I want you to notice this in this scripture, that the religious people were indignant. They didn't really care where there were miracles going on. They just wanted to complain that things weren't the way they were supposed to be. Are you ever like that? Ah, oh, you're sitting in my seat. I always sit there. I sit there because I have a bad leg and I need to extend it out. But you didn't think about me. Why didn't you think about me? Oh, the music's too loud this morning. The worship went on too long. Why do we always say that? It, you know, we have to be careful. We have to check ourselves the spirit that we carry that we have a positive spirit, that we're not a complainer, that we look, because what happens is that when we carry that spirit, we miss out on the miracle. You see, there can be miracles going on all around us, and we won't see them because what we're looking for is the problem. We're never looking for the solution. We're not looking for the good stuff. We're just seeing the bad stuff. And to be honest, even the bad stuff's not really bad. It's just us. And so these religious people, Leaders, they were getting indignant when all these wonderful miracles were going around them. A number of years ago, I was in Uganda, and I was with a church from Somerset, and there was a young, uh, not a young, she was, actually, she would like it if I said she was young. Her name was Rachel. She was 63 years of age, and she came out to see 
her sponsored child, Loy. Loy was no longer three like Susanna is here. She was 17. She'd never met her. But she joined this church a number of years uh, ago, and she'd sponsored it at Spring Harvest events, something like that. And then she found out they partnered in Uganda, and she thought, well, if they're going on a trip to Uganda, I'd like to go too. I can meet my sponsored child. And so they all sponsored an area called Masaka in the south, southern part of Uganda, but she sponsored in Kampala, in the slums of Kampala. And so on the final day, we were going to visit Loy in the slums of Kampala. And um, we were sat in this hotel lobby, and this car pulls up. This is like the last but one day before we're going back. And someone gets out of the car, and it's a member of the, the staff from the Compassion Uganda office, who we met earlier in the week when we'd gone to the country office. And out the other side gets this young lady. And so Rachel sees her. So she's been writing letters to her for years and, like, exchanging photographs, and she suddenly sees this 17-year-old girl who's, like, way taller than her. And they look at each other, and it's like a scene from a movie, you know? Like slow-mo. You know, like running towards each other. And I just stopped what I was doing right there, and I just started to cry, and I just saw this wonderful miracle right in front of me. And I'll tell you why it was a wonderful miracle. They started having this conversation, and she said, oh, she said, Rachel, it's so good that you've come to see me. And, and uh, Lloyd looked at her, and she said, oh, Rachel, my mother, you've come. Rachel said in a very middle-class English way, oh, Lloyd, I'm not your mother. I'm your sponsor. And Lloyd looked at her, and she said, you know, since I was seven, my uncle's been looking after me right next to the local church. And besides my uncle, you're the only person that has ever said they love me and was for me. She said, you are my mother. You're the mother that God gave me. Amen. You see, that's a miracle. Only God puts a middle-class woman from England and puts her to be the mother with a young lady from the slums of Kampala. Years later, Rachel emails me and she says, Darren, I know you tell me my story when you go out, but do you know that my husband and I, we went out to see a graduate from Kampala University. She said, I want my English mum and dad to be there too. And they've been out. And they said, here's the thing. They said, and, and so I will share this with you. They said, we thought we were going to change her story. But really, it's changed our story too. And that's what I want to say to you. You know, when you... When you enter into someone else's world, when you're part of what? The church. When you're part of doing something the way that God does, he expands your heart and he expands your world and he makes it bigger, so much bigger than it could ever be before. And you would just, you would just experience just the wonder and the miracles of God just by saying yes to him. Final thing I noticed in the scripture is it says this, that the children were singing praises. The children were singing praises. This young girl, Suzanne, she's three years of age. Loy has had a story, and it's come and it's gone. And Rachel was part of her story. But one of you this morning could be part of Suzanne's story. And she still has a story yet to be created, to be told. And I would ask you whether you consider to be a part of someone's story like this. You see, Suzanne, she's going to grow up not to be in poverty because she's in the Compassion Project in the local church. And she's going, to see, she's going to see the wonders of God. And the thing is this, that she is probably going to have children when she's an adult. And those children are not yet born. And the scripture tells me in Psalm 22 that those not yet born will hear of his good deeds. And I believe that Suzanne's children, who are not yet born but are known by God, because he knows us before we were born and sown in our mother's wombs, yeah, that they will rejoice because on this day in 2019, their mother was sponsored and in their, their life was invested in. That's the opportunity. Children singing praises. About eight years ago, I close with this story. About eight years ago, uh, when Comic Relief was on, just finished, we just had one recently. Lenny Henry was in the slums of Kabira in Kenya with three other celebrities. They were like soap stars from EastEnders, that sort of stuff. And the, the idea was that they all had to live there for a week. And some of you might remember it. They had to live there for a week, wear the same sort of clothes, 
and they couldn't use their own wealth to help the families in any way, they had to come back and report and film on it. They get two days in, Lenny Henry, he says, I can't do this anymore. Now, I know that he's got a Christian heritage from his mother. I'm not sure whether he's a practicing Christian himself. But, you know, I believe that godliness resides in all of us somewhere. It just needs the Spirit of God to bring it to life. And, of course, when we give our lives to Christ, it does. But there's something in there, a connection that God can make with us where he speaks to us in certain circumstances. And I believe he spoke to Lenny Henry right at that moment because this is what happened. Lenny Henry said, and he says, I can't do this anymore. I can't live with this family and become their friends and know them personally and love them and not do anything for them when I have the ability to do something. He's quoting from 1 John 3.17 without knowing it. It says, if you have means to help one of these and you do not, how can you say that the love of God lives within you? And he's saying, I've got the ability, I've got to do something. The producers say, you can't do anything, it's not fair. On the rest of the community, he says, sure it is, because we're going to film, and we're going to raise loads of money when we get back to the UK on Comet Relief Night. But I must do something for this family. And so he did. He built them a place on the edge of the slums, because that's where they were living. It didn't cost them a huge amount of money for him, but he did it. And they were there on, on the edge. They, and so it just meant the little girl in the family wasn't, sleeping next to some corrugated iron with an open sewer running right down the edge of where she would sleep. So he built them something a little bit more secure right there. And then he sits down. And you're like sometimes when you're watching TV or you're watching a movie and God speaks to you just when you don't expect it. This happened to me. I'm watching it on TV. I'm eating some fish and chips. Just sitting there. And Lenny Henry does this. And he sits there. And he looks at the camera and he says, that feels better. And suddenly I had this cold feeling go down my spine. And I thought, what? He's just done it for himself. Yeah. And I thought, no, he didn't. So I started to rationalize it and thought, he did it for them, but he did it for himself as well. And I thought, why did he do that? And I realized it's the way God's created us. It's the way that God's wired us. That's why he wants us to be involved in the process. Because he knows what's good for us. Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these, you do it for me. And then when we came into church this morning and we're raising our hands and we're led by the wonderful worship team, we don't worship God together because he's insecure. We don't say, oh, I better worship God and, and just tell him how good he is because he might feel a bit insecure later on. No, we don't do that, do we? The reason, the reason we worship God together and we tell him of his goodness is not so much that God needs to hear it, it's that we need to hear it as we shout and declare the goodness and the greatness of God and understand who he is in our lives and what he's achieved and what he can do for us. And also we know that as we walk through our lives in Manchester or wherever we live, that the problems that beset us, because we all have problems, you do know that when you, you walk in life with blessing, but it's twin tracks. You get challenged right at the same time. Don't ever any think that anyone's just floating through life. Everyone's got their trouble and strife. And you will get, sometimes you get harder seasons of that. And this week you may have had a hard season of that. But you know that when you come into the house of God and you say, God, I worship you in spirit and in truth. And I recognize that you are God over everything. That suddenly you start to see your problems in the perspective of the way that God sees them. And you say, God, you are good. And you always do good. Whatever happens, you are a good God. And I know you've got the end from the beginning. And I'm just in the middle. I'm in chapter 12, and there's chapter 20 to go yet. Yeah? Chapter 21, there's going to be a better day. And God's saying to you, you get a chance to be a part of this. Psalm 41, verse 1 says this. It says, do good to those who are down on their luck. That's what God does. Comma. You'll feel good too. See, God's so good. God's so good, he says, when, when you get to help somebody else, you get to feel good too. You get to draw closer to me. You get your world to be enlarged. You get, your, you get things to happen in your life that you never ever thought were ever going to happen because you entered someone else's world and changed their story. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning for those of you that already have changed someone's story, maybe to change someone else's as well, if you can afford to. And for those of you that think to yourself, do you know, I would like to be part of this thing that we're doing here together at Five Le Faith Life Center. And just as I talked about the stories about when we went out with other churches, I would love to be taking you guys out to Burkina Faso 
And we can, we can share in the story of India and how that goes in the future as well and believe for God's goodness and what will happen there. But right now, why don't we just bow our heads together? Father, you're so good to us. And you take care of us. And we know that when we put our focus on you, you help us to see the world in a way that we've never seen it before. We see it with your eyes. Lord, you're asking us that question, what kind of house will you build for me? And I know that this house is a house of generosity and of love and of kindness. And Lord, I'm asking this morning that you would just speak into our hearts for those of us that have been touched by this, that we may be able to respond and say, yes, I'd like to invest in a little child's life. Lord, just speak to us right now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Just while you, every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you think to yourself, I've got some friends, some of my friends here, some of the stewards. Guys, if you'd just like to come forward, that would be great. Just don't, Actually, just open your eyes for a second. Just have a look. They've got these little child profiles here. Now, here's the thing. I don't want you to feel guilty about this. If you can't afford it, and you know genuinely whether you have the means, if you don't have the means, God's not challenging you to do something where you don't have the ability to. God's challenging you if you've got the ability to. He's saying, mm, maybe you should be thinking about this. Okay, so if you think, I'm thinking about this, in a moment or two, we're just going to, I'm going to ask you, would you pop your hand up? And we just pop a profile to you. Now, when you get that profile, it doesn't even mean then that you absolutely have to sponsor that child. You might just look and say, no, it's not for me right now. But I'm really hoping that if you popped your hand up, you're, you're, you're nearly there. You're saying, yeah, I'm going to do something. And then I'll tell you what to do with that after that. But let's just, why don't we pray right now for these children? Because these are individual lives. Would you just hold your hands out towards these children here? Let's just pray. Father, we pray that for these kids. Father, that you will bless them richly. Lord, that they will know hope. They will know future. They will know a wonderful eternity. But not only that, oh God, they will be life changers in their community in Burkina Faso, one of the poorest countries in Africa. Lord, we know there's even trouble and strife going on there at the minute. There's some oppression going on. But we pray that you will bless them, Lord. You will make them strong that they would be, these, both the boys and the girls, that they would be all that you have called them to be, that nothing would hold them back, that they would fulfill the destiny that you have called them to. In Jesus' name, amen. So just this, now let's just close our eyes, but let's just, if you, if you feel right now that you would like to respond and you think to yourself, I would like to take one of these profiles and have a look and I would, I would like, do you know, I think I'd like to invest in a child's life in this way. Would you just pop your hand up after three and one of my friends will get one of these profiles to you real quick, okay? Three, two, one. Just pop your hand up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hands going up. Just pop those, get those out to them as quickly as you can. I'm just going to give you, hey, would you sponsor this little one for me, Susanna, I've been talking about. I'll give you, give you that one. Is that okay? Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Just pop your hand up real quick again if you're having a quick thought there and you're thinking there's another lady over there at the back. There's a gentleman here, just here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Would you just look up to me for a second? On the, in those profiles, can I just borrow one of those for a second? Thank you. Um, you'll see inside here right now, this is the what you need to do with that profile if you'd like to invest in that child's life. The profile that you've got in your hand it's not in anybody else's hand anywhere else in the world. So this, it's not a duplicate. You know, this little one here, Zachariah, is Zachariah is only here in Faith Life Manchester today. Are we on this one too? Yeah, okay. So let me just explain, for, first of all, with this one, I'm just going to use it and I'll pass them over to you. You just put your name and your details there and you just tick the appropriate boxes. Please tick the box that you want to be con, um, connected with by email or something and we can just connect with you that way. And then on the right-hand side, you put in your bank details. If you've got your sort code and account number, you don't need to write the full address because we can find it out from the sort code and account number. Then what you do is you just tear that little piece off. You keep the photograph and you bring this part here to Erica or I back at the table out there. And then in a couple of weeks, you get a welcome pack come through explaining to you a little bit more about how it works. But you'll get to write letters to that child. And in two or three weeks, they'll get to know your name, that you're sponsoring them. And you start to build that relationship. And I'm really believing as a church we'll be able to go out and visit Burkina Faso 
at some point in the future. God bless you. Thank you so much. Church, I want to thank you today for listening to me so generously. Thank you for your response. Thank you, Sid, for taking part with me today. And thank you, uh, Joel and Evie, for just being so faithful and, uh, and giving me the opportunity just to, to, to speak here in this church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Awesome. Praise God. Awesome. Well, guys, um, we'll be coming to a close here pretty soon, but um, today, if you want to just take some time and go home and look and find out what Compassion's doing as well, I encourage you to do that. Or go on to YouTube, um, Compassion UK, and see all the videos. Or, or just take some time to speak with Darren and Erica uh, at guest services after service today just to find out some more information. Find out how you can be part. Amen? Or grab a profile if you didn't get a chance to. Praise God. I just have it on my heart to actually um, pray for Burkina Faso. Because this is the kind of element that I love as a church. We're actually partnering, in a sense, with communities. And each of those communities have a, have a local church. So we're connected here with an incredible work over there. And many pastors and churches um, in Burkina Faso. But they are experiencing... Um, it just increased pressure politically. They've had some terrorism. It's um, there's a lot of um, different kind of groups and and things, especially on the borders of the country. I'm told. So let's just pray for that nation in Jesus' name. And this is part of what we're doing. We have that little person in our home, um, or you're taking that person home today. But you're connecting to a nation. And as Joel said today, God said, "Yeah, Joel saying my." My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Amen. And that the nations would be shaken. Hallelujah. So, Father, we lift up Burkino Faso this morning as this church connects with that church and those places and those children. In Jesus' name, we pray protection for them. We pray for favor for them. Lord, just lift that nation. Righteousness does exalt a nation. So, Father, let your light shine in that place and in government and, and, and ex expose the, um, the, the criminality and the crime in these areas. Expose it. And, Lord, let it be done in a righteous way. Protect these children, Father. And I pray for the doctors and the, and the nurses and health workers that are in those places, Father. Um, Lord, I pray for the wisdom of God in them to help these kids and the teachers and the, uh, the, the, com the campus workers there, Father, that they are wise and able to see into these situations and help these kids. We just lift up the whole work, the whole network in Jesus' name to you, Father. And we just pray numbers it's the benediction god bless them and keep them lord make your face to shine on them and be gracious to them and lord lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace shalom shalom in jesus mighty name today in jesus name Amen. You know, as a church, we're going to continue to pray for Burkina Faso and lift up that nation. We're actually going to um, make more of their presence known um, just to have more, uh, like, have a, a, a place in our foyer. So you're coming and you're going, you're reminded to pray for that nation um, and the nations of the earth. Amen. And isn't that good? So praise God. We're stepping up another level this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I feel like our heart is growing. That's such an important thing and such a powerful thing. Amen? Praise God. All right? Glory to God. Well, we're coming to a close of our service. So why don't you stand on your feet? Glory to God if you can. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your, your word today, a reminder of your house and the type of house we're building, Father. We thank you that you build your house and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. He's building his house and we're participating in that every step of the way. God gives us strength today. God causes his face to shine on you today. God makes you strong in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. Well, why don't you take your seats just one minute. We're going to have some announcements and then we'll close from that point. So let's have some announcements just to find out the next week and a few things that are coming up. Glory to God.
Um, one thing, actually, Andre, I'm going to help you. You come on up here. Andre's going to do the announcements. Thank you, Andre. Um, do you have an announcement for the for the youth? You got that. Awesome. All right, let's receive Andre in these announcements. Awesome. One, two. Okay, just a few announcements before we close. Um, as Pastor Joel mentioned before, this Wednesday will be our midweek flow service. So those that can, please come and join us together. Um, this Saturday, as mentioned also, prayer storm, the gathering of prayer storm. In fact, this is a new announcement. It will be taking place at Audacious Church. That's the 18th of May next Saturday from 12 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sorry, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. Beg your pardon. Okay, so that will be taking place at Audacious Church. Okay. Also next Sunday, James Aladrin also will be coming to minister here at Faith Life. And just one of the, in terms of prayer storm, you can actually see this movement uh, alongside social media. Just to be a bit more familiar what goes on, they've used, our, they've used our facility a few times, as many of you guys know also. Also, just want to say a big thank you to everyone who supports the food bank, not least the children's ministry. The food bank, however, does need more donations on a regular basis. We have actually increased um, rapidly in the demand of families um, that regularly attend here each Thursday. The current need would be met, however, if we were able to give, say, 10 or more bags each week in addition to what we're currently given. It actually breaks down to about 30 to 40 people committing to bring an average of just three items extra to your normal shopping list or to your grocery list, whatever it is. Three extra items for 30, 40 people would be able to meet the needs of this community. Also, there are some flyers if you would like to know more or if you would like to be a part of that. Number one, you can find that out from the reception area where we've got our guest um, support area. But there's also flyers at the back if you'd also like to find out what items you can contribute and help towards the food bank. The report in the news this week actually says that poverty in children and families visiting food banks are actually at an all-time low, all low. But we can support that and we can actually change that by, yeah, it, it's actually increasing. Um, whereby, you know, there is a shortage all around and that's not just in the area of Manchester. Now, there are a few ways that we can change that. Number one, by committing to bring at least three items, um, please remember also to bring your donations on a regular basis. You can actually add money to your giving by specifically mentioning on the giving envelopes to go specifically to the food bank and it will go to that area. Also, you can give online as, as we also do with tithes and offering through the faithlifecenter.com um, website and you can also connect via our church hello one two okay and also just to say that what you guys give um whether it's one item whether it's free whether it's more it does actually make a huge difference you know it may be seen as small or you know um, insufficient when you are putting it in your grocery bags but you know we can each make a difference to the lives of many people in this community who do come to this food bank on a regular basis. Now, a few more no announcements. On the 8th of June, um, to all Rhema and friends of the Lumini Evening event, it will be taking place from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Registration um, is required via the Rhema UK website, so you can go online to find and register there. On the 9th of June, Reverend Marty Black Wilder will be ministering here at Faith Life, both at the 10 a.m. service and also at the 6 p.m. service. And all, sorry, Pentecost Sunday, correct. Yeah, Pentecost Sunday, Reverend Marty Black Wilder will be ministering here. And as you guys know today, Ambassador Darren and obviously his wife Erica are with us to share more today. They will actually be located at the guest service 
reception which is immediately as you come through the door on the left hand side it will be on our right as you go out there and if you have any more questions or you want to find out more they'll be there to connect with you also um, do join in our communications by you know connecting there with us if you're not already registered on our connection list you can do so meet one of our teams at the back we've got many staff there that are in black t-shirts they're a part of our welcome team we can register you you can also connect and keep um, connected via our church we app with many events that are going on here in the church also last but not least there is an announcement for all children and youth from the 9th to the 11th of august children aged 11 to 14 and 15 to 18 will be having a retreat it's 74 pound it includes travel food and accommodation and we ask you please to ensure that you don't miss out please register by the 19th of july and just before we close um, for those that don't know it was actually pastor joel's birthday yesterday so you know it would be nice just before we close there today if we could sing happy birthday to our pastor it's great to have you back yeah. happy birthday to you happy birthday to you Happy birthday, Pastor Joe. Happy birthday to you. We want to thank all those who have been able to join online today. And thank you guys there for coming. Have a great afternoon. God bless you. And we look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday Flow Night Service. Amen.